make your choices such that they do not lead down irreversible paths that may be in error. To choose on the side of resiliency over brittleness, to make sure that there's more than one way to achieve your goal. Is I would urge each of those efforts to appoint someone to be the official curmudgeon, whose job it is to repeatedly say, what else could go wrong? What have we not thought about? What are we so sure about that if we're wrong, we're really in trouble? And an officially appointed curmudgeon who is there all the time, just poking, poking, poking the balloon of arrogance that we all have that we know how to manage this stuff right, I think that would be one of the funnest jobs ever. <laughs>
too little thought that goes into where did that food come from? What, what's the human dimension that result or dimensions that resulted in the production of that food, the transport, the processing? So that, that's part of the disconnect. What we see surrounding us is this vast sea of agricultural raw materials, corn and soybeans being produced. Few people can do it better than our Illinois farmers. But people don't feel an attachment to corn and soybeans. And so um, that's one of the reasons why there's this disconnect. We, we see corn and soybeans as something that is far removed from the plate, which is true. Um, and so some of the current initiatives where mainstream agriculture is trying to reclaim um, a place in the public consciousness, some of it's a little mis misguided. When Illinois farmers say, I'm growing your food, it's really not true. And so we, we need to be accurate about what we're doing. We're producing raw materials, large amounts of them, more efficiently than we've ever done it before, but we do still have significant environmental problems that we're creating. We have ethical issues, to some extent today, being framed more and more by people who are not directly involved in agriculture. That creates problems when people frame the issue but aren't in the issue. It's a paradox that we are faced with right now that the, the understanding of agriculture is something that to some extent requires a connection to the people who do it. There, there's great eloquence coming out of the mouths of people like Michael Pollan about agriculture, but it doesn't replace the direct connection of knowing that your dad or your grandfather or some relative produces crops, does it in the way that they feel is best, and they, they're not just an automaton in some industrial agricultural machine. They're, they're not just a pawn of an industrial ag company like Monsanto. They're real people. They love their children. They take pride in what they do. At the same time, there are serious issues facing agriculture that should be critically examined. It's just difficult to do that critical examination if you don't understand the humanity that underlies agriculture as it's practiced today. Agriculture involves people. The cultural side of agriculture inherently has social dimensions. And people in agriculture, while they are business people, they also are people that are willing to take a level of Sacri they're willing to make sacrifices that almost no other type of producer in the world would be willing to do. People work second jobs so they can continue to be farmers. People don't work second jobs so they can continue to manufacture cars. People come back to help their families with the harvest or with the planting. People have a you know, people who have roots in agriculture have a love of the lifestyle, the culture. The current economic climate is driving agri agriculture towards more and more consolidation, fewer and fewer farmers, more and more decisions being made off the farm by agribusiness, more and more of the guidance that farmers receive is from people selling them inputs, so it's biased. And so that this conflict between the culture of agriculture, the social side of agriculture, and the business side of agriculture is a, a fundamental conflict that, um, that I think a lot about. My biggest concern about genetic modification is that it's being driven by a smaller and smaller number of players. Those companies are developing genetically modified crops principally because they see it as a way to dominate the marketplace, to capture their market share. But principally, what the companies have in mind is market domination. That's capitalism. But capitalism 
works, I think, most effectively when there is competition. And these companies have consolidated so greatly that we, we have a lack of competition. And we have diminishing choices for farmers. I, I think that there are genuine debates going on about the the ethics of modifying genomes in ways that we aren't completely sure what is happening. There are genuine debates about whether um, species should be, whether species boundaries should be crossed. The food chain has such a high level of GMO products in it and um, we, we simply don't have um, most parts of the food chain are not focused on identity preservation. The whole concept of a commodity is that it's undifferentiated. And so commodity crops generally are, are, not, um, are not identity preserved. There's little being done to keep one batch of soybeans from mixing with another batch of soybeans. So the, the, those those are, are important issues. But in my mind, the biggest issue is the market domination because it, it, it is antithetical to sustainability. Sustainability requires choice, it requires competition, and we, we are losing choices, we're losing competition, and um, I, you know, I don't know whether antitrust legislation is the answer. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we need to have limited interference in the marketplace from, from government, but we need to have the right regulations. We need to have fair regulations that um, allow the marketplace to function, and I think we are unfortunately moving towards a less functional marketplace because such a small number of companies have such market power or market dominance. After getting a better understanding of the human connection in agriculture, I sought to learn more about GMOs. Why are genetically modified organisms so popular among sectors of the scientific and corporate world? Can GMOs really be helpful? Can they produce food at a quicker rate? And is it safe? To find out, I flew out to Northern California and spoke with a professor from the University of California, Davis. My name is Kent Bradford, and I'm a professor here in plant sciences at UC Davis. I'm also the director of the Seed Biotechnology Center in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences here at UC Davis. Well, Davis has a history, as you say, of being a leader in agricultural uh, technology, uh, genetics and environmental aspects, management, many aspects of, uh, of agriculture. Uh, in terms of the uh, opportunities for genetic engineering, uh, I think that they're enormous. I think we've only seen just the, the very start of what uh, is potentially possible. Uh, in fact, in uh, California, is certainly not the biggest adopter of the products that we have so far. That is, uh, the primary products that uh, are available are in uh, soybean, corn, uh, cotton, and canola. Those are the major products. Uh, what the modern techniques enable us to do is not just bring wholesale changes from other uh, species or from other crops, but in fact target very specific changes that would improve uh, performance or properties that we want. Crops resistant to glyphosate or Roundup, which is uh, fortunately one of the safest agricultural chemicals we have. That is, it's uh, very effective in killing weeds uh, and other plants, uh, but it's uh, extremely low toxicity to most other things, fortunately. Uh, 2,4-D is a very old uh, herbicide that we have. It's very effective in certain cases. You probably uh, may use it in a lawn, uh, lawn weed uh, killer. Uh, but if it's not manufactured properly, uh, and in the large scale that it was being manufactured uh, during Vietnam, uh, there are uh, uh, adverse chemicals that can be in there, dioxin for one, that was uh, particularly bad. For, personally, I think we need more options. That is, the high reliance now on the few products we have that use glyphosate resistance has, in fact, uh, leading to problems. That is, some of the weeds are becoming resistant. Uh, we know f way before genetic engineering that we need to use different strategies, uh, cultural, herbicide, uh, rotations, all kinds of ways to battle weeds. And uh, the success of that product has uh, led it to be uh, probably overused by farmers. And in fact, they need other options. Uh, and they need other uh, herbicides. 
Uh, whether 2,4-D is the one, it does have some issues. It's a very broad spectrum and it can, uh, it can affect other crops and so on. Uh, in terms of uh, public safety, all of these products are thoroughly tested by the EPA and they're not released unless they can be used in a safe and, uh, and uh, reliable way. What we see down the pipeline are even uh, much more important products, I think, which are uh, those that would, for example, enhance uh, tolerance to water stress or to the variability in water availability, to uh, increase the total productivity, that is, uh, enhancing the photosynthetic capacity, the ability of plants uh, to actually uh, produce uh, carbon or, or fixed carbon. Uh, <clears throat> many of these uh, uh, achievements or, or scientific approaches have already been shown in proof of concept and we just need to be uh, working toward enhancing them and enabling them to be used. In fact, uh, we collaborate with uh, many companies. We're members of the Agricultural Experiment Station whose mission is to interact with our agricultural industries and certainly seed suppliers and, uh, and input to agricultural suppliers are important to that. So I would say uh, that in fact my view is that uh, those groups should in fact be contributing much more. That is uh, why should we not uh, ask those groups who benefit from scientific and technological advances to help pay for them? And uh, working with those companies who are the ones who are integrating new technologies into the seed is exactly where we should be. That is, the uh, seeds are the uh, microchips of agriculture in a sense. That is, that's the intel inside of agriculture because we can embody uh, many improvements genetically deliver it through a seed, which means we do not have to deliver it in other ways, that is, after the fact through pesticides or, or fertilizers or other ways. So in fact, uh, I think that it's uh, the appropriate uh, strategy that our high technology, in fact, interacts with those who will then incorporate that into varieties that are uh, made available to farmers and enhance the overall productivity. If you walk down the cereal aisle or the uh, packaged food aisle or many of the processed foods, you will find that uh, a large fraction of those uh, would contain some products made from genetically engineered uh, foods. For example, anything that uses corn starch, corn oil, uh, soybean oil, soybean protein, and so on. That is, those commodity uh, substrates for processed foods largely come from uh, genetically engineered crops because in the U.S. Uh, about 90 percent of those crops are genetically engineered. But if you go down the, uh, the produce aisle, the vegetable aisle, and fruits, uh, very few. Uh, a few papayas and uh, sometimes some squash, maybe some sweet corn. That is, it's, uh, it's very uh, biased in a sense that uh, if you eat mostly out of the vegetable side of the, uh, the market, you won't be getting very many genetically engineered foods. If you eat mostly from the uh, cereals and processed food side, then uh, you will, but not in a direct form. That is, it's only as... Uh, uh, sugar or starch or, or those very highly refined uh, processed products, which uh, in fact, because they are refined, uh, it really doesn't matter whether they come from a genetically engineered product or not. That is, it's starch, it's sugar, it's the same product no matter where it came from. Well, drought resistance is a huge target for all uh, agricultural developers now, I think, and, and breeders. Uh, we know that we will probably be seeing more drought or at least more uh, variable rainfall, even in the Midwest. Uh, there are some products already being introduced and tested. Uh, my understanding is that in the recent droughts that we had in those tests, that they, uh, they did show advantages, uh, somewhere around 7% or so yield increases uh, due to some of those products. Uh, I have a colleague at uh, UC Davis, uh, Eduardo Bloomwald, who has uh, developed uh, crops that can show fairly uh, remarkable resilience to drought, that is, they can uh, suffer pretty extreme drought and then when rainfalls come again uh, recover and go ahead and make uh, decent yields. Certainly anytime you have water stress you're going to lose yield but the key point is do you lose everything or, or get 30 or 40 percent of the projected yield or can you recover 60 or 70 or 80 percent. This makes a huge difference uh, and it would make a huge difference around the world. So uh, contrary to what uh, many people would say about how complex that is as a trade, it certainly is uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bloomwald, has shown that, uh, in fact, just a single gene that he's introduced into a number of crops now are holding up in the field and showing that, in fact, uh, we can remarkably increase the 
resilience of crops to drought. I'm not really opposed to labeling per se. That is uh, organic labeling. Uh, it goes through a certification process. They've met certain criteria, and it's, uh, it's really a brand. I think we need to clarify labeling versus branding. <laughs> that is, uh, companies have the opportunity to brand them, their, their products in many ways. We can already brand crops uh, or products as uh, GM-free, for example, it's, and, and there are those products in the market. Uh, what I do not uh, agree with is to include that as a mandatory label uh, on a product for no reason except that a certain group feels that they would like to know that. Now, certainly consumers have a right to know what's in their food uh, when it's relevant. Now, if in fact uh, food uh, producers or supermarket chains or whoever decide that they would like to uh, label those products, they can certainly do that. I'm still opposed to making it mandatory because I don't see that there's that significant a difference, again, between whether they're genetically engineered or they're modified in other ways. How many things about how food is produced could we eventually add to that label? Many people might want to know, well, how, how really was it fertilized? Uh, was that harvested by a machine or was it harvested by a, a person? Uh, what was the, was it union labor or was it not union labor? In other words, there's all kinds of things that certain groups might feel that they would want to know about uh, their food. So unfortunately, yes, I believe Europe uh, made a, uh, a wrong turn uh, early on. And unfortunately, uh, the consequences of that are going global. That is, uh, Europe has a lot of influence on areas such as Africa uh, and other parts of the world that, in fact, could enormously benefit from things that genetic engineering could bring if allowed, such as drought tolerance and improvements in disease resistance and other things that should really be non-controversial. And so uh, Europeans can afford to do what they want, but exporting their uh, anti-GM technology around the world, I think, is, uh, is inappropriate. The current risk, the current risk, the current status quo is causing much more damage. In other words, I'll use another analogy. Uh, what would be the, the morality of saying, well, we have a vaccine for the disease that you have, but we won't let you have it because there's some fraction of a possibility that some people may have a bad reaction to it. This is a fact. Every vaccine we have, some people are sensitive to it. But in one in a million, we're willing to take that risk. With genetic engineering, many groups are not willing to take any risk. In other words, the, the pure precautionary principle that many cite wants zero risk whatsoever, no matter what the consequences of not employing that technology are. So how can we, you know, how could we stop not use the polio virus to stop a known problem uh, on the co possibility that sometime in the future there might be possibly some negative. I uh, mentioned also that these are in crop plants. Uh, this ki idea that, well, once we do it, it's a total commitment, uh, we'll never go back, that's not true. We change varieties all the time. If it turns out that uh, some consequence of a particular product we don't like, we just quit using it, just like we do anything else. That is, this is not a once and for all thing. If we were to enable the scientists to really use this technology with proper uh, safety concerns, of course, everything needs to be tested. Uh, but if we were to enable to use that, then we would have at least a chance of keeping up with the climate change, the population increases, and so on that are coming down the pike. We need to double food production in the next 30, 40, 50 years in the face of diminishing resources and climate change. And to tie our scientific hand behind our back in this field of food while allowing it to go forward in every other area of technology uh, is not a future that I envision. Uh, overall, uh, I think the benefits uh, greatly outweigh the, uh, the potential disadvantages because uh, so far uh, none of those have actually materialized. As GMOs continue to cultivate onto the nation's farmland and into our grocery stores, concerned Americans worry that consumption of genetically modified organisms could pose lingering effects not only on humans, but to the soil as well. What do you have against uh, GMOs? What concerns you the most about genetically modified organisms? What concerns me is that they take genes from bacteria and viruses and inject them into plants with unknown repercussions. These genes that have taken millions of years to develop to encode for specific proteins are being messed with on this molecular level. We have absolutely no idea what we're doing. There's no way to control it. We don't know what the repercussions are going to be. And uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed that, that it, our generation is to blame for releasing something like this. What concerns you the most about genetically modified organisms? What concerns me the most about it is the government and Monsanto lie about the effects of GMOs. What they do to people in the mid-90s when GMOs became very prevalent, 
the rises of diseases, autism, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, obesity, all are a direct correlation to the rise of genetically modified organisms. What did you study in college and, and what is it about drought? They, they say drought resistant seeds help produce a stronger yield, it helps produce food during a drought, it would help feed the world during climate change. What do you say to that argument? Uh, as an agronomist, um, I have, I'm familiar with Atra. If you are interested in finding out the science about organic versus conventional, check out Atra Organic. They have some scientific studies in which they showed that organic farms in Central America and South America have been able to produce a yield in whenever there's extreme t uh, climate conditions, like in hurricanes and stuff like that. You can still produce food from your organic farms, whereas your conventional farms, which have no real soil stability or environmental stability, they just collapse and they don't produce anything in these. So, um, and and the answer to drought and acidic soil is not making crops that are resistant. To that it's adjusting our own style and listening to the earth and listening to what the earth wants to grow there. So, if we have acidic soil, then we need to grow blueberries or acidic loving crops. If we have drought, then we need to start growing um, plants that are more resistant to drought like rye and uh, oats and stuff like that and get rid of the wheat. You need to, it needs to be more intensive for just for the area, micromanagement. I do not believe in altering seeds in any way possible. All seeds should be heirloom. They should not be altered in any way possible. It's been proven that Monsanto crops when they are planted over a period of years, their yield decreases and more fertilizers increase. And that will be proven the same with uh, drought resistant seeds. And they, Monsanto will have um, the uh, certain seeds that are resistant to their herbicide sprays, so the farmers have to buy seed from them, then they have to buy the, the herbicides and pesticides from them also. So it's kind of a monopoly for one thing. There's a chemical Monsanto's been talking about, 2,4-D, which was used in uh, Agent Orange, and they add it into their Roundup Ready Extends, and it, it goes into the food supply, in turn we eat it. How damaging, from your research, are these chemicals that they put onto the soil that are supposedly trying to kill weeds? So, they're in the business of death, first and foremost. That's what these chemicals do. They were originally made to be used in war, like in Vietnam and before that World War II and after Vietnam when they ran out of uh, people to sell their chemicals to for killing people or for killing plants out in Vietnam, they just they turned to the agriculture uh, market and now they're putting these chemicals on our soil. And as far as persistence goes, uh, well, they're there forever. And uh, there's even studies that show that the, the GMO genes that as we don't know what the repercussions from those are. They're showing up in soil-borne organisms and those things work their way up through the food chain. The chemicals they use, the pesticides and herbicides, um, are just extremely poisonous and um, we, you know, we can't help but get residue from that. And that, most of the grain, the corn is fed to livestock and then, you know, we in turn get that that residue in our in the meat products we buy and basically as these smaller organisms consume the plants that are sprayed with the herbicides and stuff like that and those say they're resistant and they survive but they have contaminants now in their body the birds then go and eat that and the animals that eat the birds or so forth it climbs all the way up the food chain to the humans and these aluminum and heavy metals and toxic substances accumulate in us especially whenever we consists our diet mainly of animals and stuff like that, which is why we need to eat more plants. Genetically altering the food I eat, to me, just sounds wrong. <laughs> I mean, despite even, you know, I've read scientific research on it too, but just basically it does not sound right to me. I mean, I, I am just, I want to eat food that is fresh, local, that has not been altered with, that does not have extra chemicals, that not, doesn't have hormones that hasn't been genetically changed. So personally, that's just my, my feeling. They want to label the products that have direct GMO ingredients, but animals which are fed GMO corn and soybean, and you'll see when you buy all natural beef or chicken, it, it says uh, asterisk, free range, and all vegetarian fed. And all that means is that they just gave that animal access to a little four by four area of grass. And 
when it says vegetarian diet, that means they just fed them GMO corn and soybeans. So um, really, it's no different than just straight consuming the GMO corn. It actually may be more damaging for your body because these animals that have ingested this unnatural food, are their immune systems are compromised and yours will, can equally become compromised by consuming those animals. When Proposition 37 came up in California, um, you can see that the number of companies, well, it's hard to see, but the number of companies who supported that fight by donating money so that that Proposition 37 would not pass, um, you can see there's major companies, Monsanto, of course, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, um, and then some companies which I was really shocked, Cashy, Cascadian Farms, R.W. Knudsen, um, Silk. I was really shocked to see those supposedly organic companies that did not support, you know, going against the GMOs. And then there's a list of companies that that did work towards, you know, getting that. So you got to be careful what you buy. If, if you, you know, you've got to buy with the companies who are doing the things that you believe in and boycotting the other companies. Why do you feel entities like the USDA or the FDA aren't doing anything? They say, oh, we want to do food safety, but in reality, they're not. Well, the FDA and um, the EPA and all these government organizations are pretty much run by money, let's say that first and foremost, and um, Clarence Thomas, who wrote the deciding decision on the Supreme Court case, which gave them the right to own life, used to work for Monsanto. Uh, that's just one example of the ability of these companies to get on the inside and control these organizations that are supposed to represent us, the people, and it's time that we took them back. That is extremely concerning to me, that a basically a chemical company can have that much say in American politics and government. I. To me, it's just really alarming. You're standing right behind the White House. Why hasn't the president, why hasn't Congress done anything against Monsanto? They, uh, you know, they play the hand of, oh, we're trying to do something on food safety. Yet, there's a lot of concerns about GMOs and very little testing done on the health effects of GMOs. Why hasn't the president, why hasn't Congress done anything to look into GMOs? Money. That's the bottom line. Money. They all get, the lobbyists are rampant in Congress. President Obama has appointed Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, former, uh, 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 former of the year in Iowa by Monsanto. He has Michael Taylor as his food czar, who is an executive from Monsanto. He has Elena Kagan on the Supreme Court, who has written a brief in support, uh, uh, in support of Monsanto, and we have Bowman versus Supreme Court going in a couple of weeks. She will not recuse herself. It's about money. They're all in this together. The public outcry has grown louder and louder over the last few years, expressing their concerns over the safety of GMOs, and more specifically, drought-resistant seeds. But are they that harmful? Can a drought-resistant seed produce food with little to no water at all? I decided to find out while attending the USDA Agriculture Outlook Forum just outside of Washington, D.C., where I was able to speak with professionals in the industry. Uh, Julio Alceo, how has uh, drought-resistant seeds changed in, 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 in the market? What type of trends do you see drought-resistant seeds going in the next year or, or next few years if the drought trend continues in parts of the Midwest? And for the CME side, for weather derivatives, how could a farmer or, or a trader looking at, say, uh, potentially another current drought trend, how could one manage weather derivatives for a farmer if they want to protect their farmland from another terrible drought season? I can take an initial crack at that. This is an area of very active debate among crop scientists and uh, others, uh, in particular for corn, uh, are our uh, GMO varieties with the uh, stack traits in particular uh, much more drought resistant 
than the varieties that preceded uh, these uh, stack trait uh, hybrids. Uh, my own view from the research that we've done is that while they, those, that technology has certainly contributed to uh, our continued growth in trend corn yields, that their impact on, in terms of drought tolerance is fairly small. Uh, evidence of that would be we have a crop weather model that we use, uh, and in fact, uh, our predictions with that model based on data for the last 50 years were too high uh, without taking into account any changes in trend due to drought tolerance. So I don't think the evidence is very convincing that our current hybrids have all that much better drought tolerance than, than they had, say, 15 or 20 years ago. We may have seen a bit of an uptick, a small uptick in the rate of growth in corn trend yields, but, but I don't think it's been uh, large. We're not going to get to 300 bushels per acre anytime soon. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, science does progress, and I think that you can be more optimistic as you look further down the road with uh, some of the genetic technologies that have, are in the laboratory and starting to be field tested that maybe we can see some more progress as we look down maybe a 5, 10, 15 year horizon uh, into the future. The problem with drought tolerance is that it's incredibly difficult to pinpoint the changes in the plant to make it more drought tolerant because just like last summer, if you get a two or three week blast of scorching heat in just the wrong period and that's not the time period that you've timed your drought tolerance uh, characteristics in the corn plant, it's worthless. So it's very hard to make a general change in the plant genetics that will make it more drought tolerant. I, I would just add there is some technology out there, right? So it, it's coming out, it's, it's, it's adopting, you hear statistics around six bushel per acre, 10, 12, depending upon how you do your math, uh, yield increase when in drought uh, stricken areas. So I, I think that, you know, it's like many of the technologies that come, it, it, it's going to come. I think that they will figure out a way to do it. And it solves two things at one time. It solves a growing need for food, and it solves the water resource relative to that growing need for food. So if it can get done and if it can be effective, I would say it will be good. I would also add that, you know, what you heard this morning regarding to synchronous approvals, worldwide are a big deal uh, for the industry and making sure that as we roll these products out, we're able to um, use those and access markets worldwide uh, that, that want to take them. So I, I would just say, as these new things come out, there'll be a lot of dialogue coming on about how fast they're adopted, where they're adopted, and how we do that, all towards an increase in technology. Because if you remember the the yield chart, without that, we're going to have a hard time feeding the world. So I'm Dave Bodler. I'm with Cargill in Minneapolis, and I'm here as part of the uh, forum, the panel uh, that just talked about uh, markets and the relationship of markets to the different companies, CME, ourselves, and University of Illinois. This topic of, of drought tolerance and doing that is an important issue in a dry year like we're just coming off of. This will be a big issue relative to the crop we just got done with, and if we have adequate rainfall, a drought-resistant crop will be less important. But as we, as we uh, encourage crops to go west on corn production, drought tolerance in those areas will be important for the producer to be able to reduce their risk of a crop failure. Uh, following this summer, we've, seen, we've heard more and more news about drought resistant seeds or drought tolerant seeds. Could you explain a little bit about what is a drought resistant seed and how long this, this uh, sort of product has been in development? Yeah, it's a seed that grows a plant that in a stressed year requires less moisture or performs better in a dry year that protects them against that. So this is technology that's coming out through genetic engineering. It's uh, technology that the farmer is very interested in because it reduces its, ri 
his or her risk in planting. So it's coming out, it's to protect in the bad years, uh, and you know the, the good products will come out without any drag on good years when they do have adequate moisture, that they're still able to have their high yielding crops in those years as well. What is the difference, say, from a drought-resistant seed compared to a regular or organic type of type of seed? Are there differences? Or are there any similarities? So it's a again, it's a seed to grow a plant that that uses less water. Yes, it's uh, genetic. Most of them that are coming out are genetically engineered. Whether it's genetically engineered um, or a hybrid, has also created a lot of solutions for farmers around risk protection and increasing yields. So it's one of the many things coming out to the farmers to be able to increase production. Uh, so it is in a different area than the organic space uh, and it'll be a choice for what the farmers incented to plant. Some may be concerned about drought resistant uh, seeds or genetic engineering of food that it may be unsafe to eat. What are What's the other side of the argument? How safe is genetic engineering of food, and what what type of trend do we will we see genetic engineering of food in the future? I think that the important thing is that we keep the conversation and the facts fact based. So if we use science and fact based, that's going to be the key to make sure that we have good products out there for people to use. And then finally, looking at looking at the drought, if you know, Lord willing, that we don't have a drought and things go back to relative normal. Will will there still be a market for drought tolerant seeds? And if not, what what will a bounce back be? Since it's hard to predict what the next year will be, there'll probably be some market for that when it's resonant in the producer's mind. From last year, there's probably a hotter market than there'll be after three years of great crops. Uh, if it's at a big premium to plant, you'll probably see less uh, less participation. But they've all been through a drought one year or another, and they'll respond. It's clear that both sides will agree to disagree on this subject. Yet, where's government? What's our elected officials and those in the administration's stance? Are they listening to the concerns of the public or listening to the guidance of the agriculture industry? An executive from the United Nations saw GMO seeds as one alternative to feed third world nations. Now, there are companies, food companies out there like Monsanto or Cargill, Pioneer, Dow, where they're actually going one step further, producing seeds for corn, soy, wheat that are resistant to drought. Do you see that as something being beneficial to help farmers and not just here in America, but throughout the world, be able to produce food despite the drought? Yes, we need seed which are uh, resistant, drought resistant. We need it. But it's not the, the only response. It must be holistic. The response must be holistic. As you, I have said, the vulnerability to drought is about, in many cases in Africa, is about rural poverty and desertification. If the land is degraded, you likely not to make much out of the, your drought resistant seed. So the response must be global, it must be holistic. And of course, research to have improved seed are part of it. U.S. Representative Tim Hulskamp embraced genetic modification when I posed the question to him. Would you be in favor of labeling uh, non-genetically modified foods compared to genetically modified foods. There's been a big debate going on. Uh, Monsanto has been a big lobbyist in Capitol Hill to restrict the labeling of genetically modified foods. Are you in favor of giving the people a choice to, to wonder what is GMO and what's non-GMO? Well, a lot of times, the uh, and, and I'm a farmer, farmer myself, and they use those products, and uh, I think they are uh, perfectly safe, and, uh, and there's Obviously, uh, some environmental groups that use scare tactics uh, about that, and numerous others. So, but I say let the market. If folks want to see that and they want to pay a lot more for organic, I mean that they will have that identified. And uh, but uh, most of what we use has uh, has uh, been genetically enhanced at various times. I mean uh, the the, uh, the ability of uh, folks uh, in uh, particularly environmentalism but to uh, misuse 
and mislead folks. I'll give you a perfect example of that is this uh, issue of uh, lean, finely textured beef. And you might have heard about that, uh, folks. Uh, we, we uh, because of misinformation coming out of uh, one television outlet, I think it was CBS News, ran 30 consecutive stories that were full, was full of bad science, misinformation. And in my district, they eliminated 250 jobs and said, go home. And uh, they shut down a plant. There were four plants around the country. I'll tell you today, lean, finely textured beef was the safest beef you could buy in the entire country because of the innovative process by which they killed E. coli. But don't let science get in the facts, uh, folks in Washington and in many of these movements. And so everything needs to be fact-based, but uh, you know, let uh, consumers have those particular choices. And recently, Montana Senator John Tester was vocal on the Senate floor in his stance against Washington favoring the agriculture industry. It's time to highlight the need for greater transparency and openness so voters can hold their elected leaders accountable and for what happens here in Washington, D.C., and to just know what's going on. The second provision sent over from the House tells the USDA to ignore any judicial ruling regarding the planting of genetically modified crops. Its supporters are calling it farmer assurance provision. But all it really assures is a lack of corporate liability. The provision says that when a judge finds that the USDA approved a crop illegally, the department must reapprove the crop and allow it to continue to be planted, regardless of what the judge says. Now let's think about that. The United States Congress is telling the Agricultural Department that even if a court tells you that you've failed to follow the right process and tells you to start over, you must disregard the court's ruling and allow the crop to be planted anyway. Not only does this ignore the Constitution idea of separation of powers, but it also lets genetically modified crops take hold across this country, even when a judge finds it violates the law. Once again, agribusiness, multinational corporations putting farmers as serfs. It's a dangerous precedent. Mr. President, it will paralyze the USDA putting the department in the middle of a battle between Congress and the courts. And the ultimate loser will be our family farmers going about their business and feeding America in the right way. Sunshine Week shouldn't be a show and tell, Mr. President. And slipping corporate giveaways into a bill at the same time that we call for more open government is doubling down on the same policies that created the need for Sunshine Week in the first place. That's why I've introduced two amendments to remove these corporate welfare provisions from the bill. Montana's elected me to go to the Senate to do away with the shady backroom deals, to get rid of handouts to big corporations, and to make government work better. We still have many challenges in front of us. And I commend the leaders of the, of the Appropriation Committee for their commitment to working together to bring us on a plan we can vote. But these two provisions undermine, undermine our good work to support family farm agriculture. These provisions are giveaways, pure and simple and will be a boon worth millions of dollars to a handful of the biggest corporations in this country. They deserve no place in this bill. We simply have got to do a better job on both policy and process. But what about USDA? Should they look into the safety issues of GMOs? Or were the activists correct and the USDA will side with the agriculture corporations? I decided to ask Secretary Tom Vilsack myself in the middle of his press conference. Secretary, uh, I had a, you mentioned about the drought, your concerns about the drought, especially in the Midwest. Uh, with drought resistant seeds being uh, discussed more out in the open, how will USDA uh, go forth with drought resistant technology? And secondly, uh, huge concerns throughout the country on the safety of GMOs for human consumption. Uh, what, what can USDA do to address those concerns? And similar to the USDA organic labeling, could we see somebody down the road at USDA GMO labeling to address those concerns? Well, you've asked a lot of questions there. Uh, I'll try to answer uh, several of them. Um, first of all, uh, USDA's role relative to any kind of seed technology is to ensure that it doesn't create um, a, a, a hazard or a danger to, uh, to plants and to, and to crops. And that's the regulatory process that we go through. Uh, folks who come up with new technology, we basically uh, uh, work through that process of, of ensuring the safety and security of that technology. And when we're convinced that they don't represent uh, the threats uh, under the Plant Protection Act, we deregulate. Uh, that's a process that takes uh, a considerable period of time and a lot of data and a lot of research. 
I don't know of any uh, reputable study at this point that suggests that there's a safety concern relative to health uh, with GE crops, um, and that's the reason why uh, they are utilized by American uh, farmers, and that's one of the reasons why we were able to get through a drought in better shape than we had anticipated, um, and it's one of the reasons why we've seen extraordinary productivity gains, uh, as Senator Daschle uh, alluded to. That regulatory process, I think, uh, it needs, needs to uh, we constantly look at ways in which we can improve the process, but the, the, the bottom line is making sure that what is deregulated is, is not presenting a threat uh, to plants and crops. Um, as far as labeling is concerned, um, let me just simply say that uh, historically, uh, labeling in this country has been about two issues, nutrition, providing nutritional information, uh, and uh, about uh, safety issues. Uh, I'm sure that either one of those fits your question. Uh, I don't think that it's not about nutrition, and I don't, again, I don't know that there's a reputable study relative to safety. So at this point, I, I don't know that we're necessarily headed down uh, at USDA a path. Um, uh, All the changes that are taking place to agriculture, to our communities, the ocean, and so forth, then we're just ignoring what science is telling us. So I will be a passionate advocate about this, but not based on ideology, based on facts, based on science. And I hope to sit with all of you and convince you this $6 trillion market is worth millions of American jobs and leadership. And we better go after We need proactive solutions. We need strategies to manage and mitigate climate change and the impacts of climate change. The majority has to deal with this question. It cannot be ignored. The Safe Climate Caucus has challenged the majority to a floor debate on climate change. We look forward to that opportunity. And for the sake of the Colorado River, that debate needs to happen. Heal back. Changes in the world's climate are at this point inevitable. It's already happening and affecting our communities, and we can expect these impacts to intensify and accelerate as climate continues to change. In my view, we need to accept these facts and modify our behavior to prevent these effects from becoming cumulatively catastrophic. We can make better choices now to prevent a disaster later. But looking at the, the likelihood of these extreme weather events, that's something domestic constituencies can relate to. Mm -hmm. They can relate to poor people waiting for aid for, to rebuild or recover after Sandy. You know, there are still hundreds of thousands of people displaced from Hurricane Katrina. And people have a, a natural sympathy and imp let's do something. Let's prevent this from happening. President Obama's right up the street here. And uh, if he takes strong executive action using his regulatory and administrative powers, that can change the equation for the polluters, where suddenly it now makes sense for them to come up to Congress and to start working with us rather than just operating by the principle of the stonewall. The debate rages as climate change, along with genetically modified organisms, have become the hot-button environmental issues. Politicians in Washington are seeking to prevent a climate catastrophe, but is that possible? Can Congress, which has a hard time balancing its budget, save the public from climate change? One investigative reporter has zero faith. I'm Mark Marano, the publisher of Climate Depot, uh, one of the most hated climate skeptics out there. I just won the Misinformer of the Year Award by Media Matters, the global warming activist. You just mentioned you've been uh, labeled a skeptic, Misinformer of the Year. What comes to your mind when, when, when you hear those type of things? Uh, do, you, do you find it laughable? Do you take it as a badge of honor? Yeah, it's a sort of badge of honor. It's fun. I mean, it's silly. What they're saying essentially is if you hold the view that you're a global warming skeptic, you're a flat earther, you're akin to a Holocaust denier, uh, and so if you go out on TV and say it, and you say it publicly, and you have a website, and you write articles, then they're like even in more horror. So they just think that you're basically a an idiot, and that's you're a smart, intelligent person if you believe, have the faith to believe in this modern day science. This is government politically correct funded science. It's not to say that every scientist is on the take or altering data, but if you study butterflies, no one's gonna pay attention to you. 
uh, if you're just doing studies on butterflies and their habitat. But if you do a study saying, hey, if the temperature were to rise six degrees by 2075 in the Northeast, what impact would that have on butterflies? Suddenly, you're going to get university press releases. You're going to get media coverage. You're going to get more funding. You're going to get published in more prestigious journals. People are going to sit up and pay attention. And all you would do is come up with a range of possibilities, different temperature ranges, possible butterfly impacts. Suddenly, this scientist who didn't, who'd ever studied whether CO2 impacts climate or how it impacts climate is now feeded by the global warming establishment as they had another scientist in the consensus when all he was really doing was benefiting from all this money. The government throws all this money into this research, foundations, research, all the journals, all the governments around the world, the United Nations are directing it. Suddenly all this money and all these scientists, well, if you're going to, let's, let's do climate. Hey, let's just study climate now. Let's get into this. This is the hot thing at the moment. Any bad things will happen with global warming. Well, guess what? Bad things happen all the time with, with weather. So now, every time a bad thing happens, as you would expect it to do, it's further proof of their theory. There's no way to falsify the theory anymore. One scientist said it's now akin to the predictions of Nostradamus, where these these cryptic messages. We now have the Mayan calendar. This is what it's basically like. It's the end of time with the Mayan calendar. James Hansen, NASA's lead global warming scientist, is practicing his own form of a Mayan calendar. In January 2009, he said Obama had four years left to save the Earth. Guess what? It expires, I believe, tomorrow, that four years that he gave Obama. So we have our NASA scientist issuing his own Mayan-like end-of-the-world calendar. This, the, the global warming movement picked up a lot of steam, and it seemed like there was going to be a uh, consensus on some sort of treaty at the United Nations conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, and then the events of climate gain, gain, as it's now known, really derailed everything. You're in Copenhagen. What, first, what was the reaction of the, the entire UN conference? And number two, what did Climate Gate do back in 2009 to derail this whole movement? Yeah, I think it helped derail. Because what I like to say is before Climate Gate, particularly in the U.S., People didn't buy this. I mean, it was a study by Gallup. More people believed in haunted houses than man-made global warming, 37 to 36 percent. If you look at what happened in Copenhagen, there was a lot of high hope. People thought we were finally going to follow up and have this new treaty and a, a mission eliminating. We were going to control the thermostat. This was modern world leaders getting together, talking about limiting the Earth's temperature, a verbal non-binding agreement. That's what they ended up with, to limit the Earth's temperature to no more than two degrees Celsius rise. Imagine... Uh, and then we laugh at witch doctors and we laugh at the ancient people who thought they could control the weather or slaughter people to control the weather. Here we think that acts of Congress, the United Nations, can control the Earth's thermostat. So in Copenhagen, Obama showed up, strolled into a room, tried to make something happen. Then he had to hightail it out of Copenhagen because there was a huge blizzard hitting Washington, D.C., which, of course, is consistent with what they predicted, even though they never predicted blizzards and extreme cold. But, hey, any weather event's consistent because uh, it's what it's because they said there would be a, big storms and records broken. Well, records are broken all the time. Obama was actually given a large share of the blame at that conference, there were protesters outside the conference screaming, Obama, shame on you. They had pictures of Obama with the phrase climate shame on them. Uh, and so partially what happened was uh, climate gate broke right before that. And it took a, the, the leaders and, the, and the, the, the political will of the leaders took a battering because that was a, all over the grassroots in America, throughout Europe. It was a huge scandal. And essentially climate gate showed us that the, the upper echelon of the United Nations, the head lead scientists were colluding to keep out studies that were inconvenient, keep out data that was inconvenient, and they were crafting a grand narrative. That's what the whole thing was about. All these UN scientists were crafting a narrative of what they wanted to say. It was preordained. They knew what they were going to say. When this science became bastardized in 1988, when the UN formed this climate panel, the IPCC, they essentially had to say CO2 impacts climate. If they fail to find that, then they fail to have a reason to exist, or fail to have a reason to have to have to even exist as an entity. So they're never going to find that. And you'll even hear the UN IPCC chairman, Regina Bachari, be like Babe Ruth. He'll tell you what the next report. Just wait till the next report. It'll be so alarming. Policymakers will have to act. Well, what kind of science is that where the guy calls it out years ahead of time, what it's going to say, and then what impact they wanted to have? This is a political process masquerading as a science body. It's a, it's an insult to everyone's intelligence. 
the governing boards, two dozen or so governing board members, politically correct with connections to politics in Washington of these big groups, National Academy of Science, American Meteorological, will go along with it in their statements. No direct vote of members, no direct input of their members. And then they're saying, hey, thousands of scientists endorse the UN. Uh, no, two dozen governing board members do. If you look at surveys in the case of the, of the American Meteorological Society, up to 75% of their members were hostile, many of them calling global warming a hoax, but yet their leaders, two dozen governing board members, say they are in complete lockstep with the UN and they therefore make up the consensus. It's a con. If Congress wants them to say global warming is a problem, by golly, Congress has paid them to say it. This is no longer science. This is po politics masquerading as science. When you go into a lot of these UN climate conferences, explain to those who, who think these conferences are just serious negotiating talks. You, you mentioned you've gone to Rio de Janeiro, you've gone to Cancun, you've gone to all these different exotic places. Why do they have these conferences? in exotic, exotic locations, and what are they all about? For the same reason I go. You know, we had them in, uh, they're having this year's in Poland. I don't think I'm going to go to Poland in December. It doesn't excite me. Now, they've had them in, Can in Cancun, they've had them in Bali, they've had them in, when I went to Kenya on the U.S. taxpayer dime, $16,000 round trip airfare business class paid for by U.S. taxpayers via the State Department. I went on a safari, I got to go to the U.N. conference, they go to these, when I went to Bali, paid for by the U.S. taxpayer, five-star resort on the water in Bali, nicer than any Hawaiian resort you could imagine, or at least as nice as any Hawaiian resort. This is why many Senate staffers went, this is why politicians like to go, this is why U.N. delegates, bureaucrats, why all the media likes to go. They know how to throw a party. When I was in Johannesburg, South Africa, they were having a summit on sustainable development and how to help poor people and the energy of the world to develop so we help poor people and not harm the earth. Well, they flew in chefs from Europe, they were doing caviar and shrimp and, uh, and uh, all kinds of exotic meats and wines and champagnes. And they interviewed the chefs and how they, all the, the world leaders were demanding all this exotic food while they sat there and talked about the plight of the poor. Here's what's, over, here's what's, here's what's forgotten in all this is that there is climate change, if you just take it as a generic term, i.e. extreme weather, uh, weather events not caused by man but naturally, has always been a danger to mankind. We should always be concerned about hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts. But the idea that we're causing it, the idea that our SUVs have turned into a weather machines, that we have the control knob and we can turn them up or down or that we can pass a cap and trade or a carbon tax and somehow as Barbara Boxer says, we must pass the cap and trade bill or we'll have worse floods, hurricanes and droughts. They actually believe that we can control the weather. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's, it's patently absurd. The bottom line is what Obama's poised to do is start regulating CO2, we inhale oxygen, exhale CO2 as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. There's going to be lawsuits, there's going to be all kinds of delays, Congress is going to try to stop it, I don't know to what effect. In addition to that, there's talk of tax reform occurring, and as part of that, a revenue neutral carbon tax being put in. As the Washington Post said, it will help fight global warming, and it will bring in, I can't remember the number, $150 billion a year. You think Washington's more interested in fighting global warming through a tax, or bringing in $150 billion a year? So that's, a, and of course it's carbon neutral, because they'll offset, lower some other tax temporarily for a year or so, but what it ultimately means is Washington Washington will have yet another tool in the toolbox that they'll have to tax. They'll have a carbon tax which they can raise at will. They'll have other taxes which will initially be offset, which they'll raise again, and then they'll say that somehow they're saving the planet. So those are the biggest threat, EPA regulations and a carbon tax loom. Some scientists have some really interesting ways to combat climate change. Cloud seeding, climate engineering, carbon taxes. They even go as far as uh, advocating plastic trees to absorb CO2. What are your thoughts when you hear scientists talk about manipulating the weather and doing all these weird things to help save the earth. Well, Obama's energy secretary wanted to paint roofs white so that we could cool the earth. You know, I don't even cover geoengineering, what you're discussing, on my website, because I think it's so patently absurd and a waste of time. Carbon capture and sequester, we need to do... All this nonsense of everything they're trying to do is an utter, futile waste of time. Not about black carbon and soot having, you know, many times the, the, the impact on climate that they ever knew. The idea that science has settled, well, you have new peer-reviewed studies no, throwing that out just this week. And so what happens is hundreds of factors influence climate and the idea that CO2 is the tail that wags the dog isn't tenable in the scientific literature. How do we know that? We look at all the other factors, everything from volcanic dust to ocean cycles to the sun, the solar system, cloud feedbacks, and then you look at the past. The medieval warm period, both northern and southern hemisphere globally, was as warm or warmer than current temperatures without benefit of SUVs. So the idea that we're driving a catastrophe isn't 
held up in the literature. And if you look at the CO2 has been many times higher in the past, we've been cooler and it's been many times lower and we've been warmer. The idea that CO2 is a control knob doesn't bear out. In the discussion on how to combat climate change, one of the options discussed is a controversial proposal ripped from the pages of science fiction. The concept of deliberately interfering with the climate isn't a brand new idea. In fact, the idea of weather modification was spearheaded in the U.S. by the United States military. But is weather modification a smart idea? Should we be deliberately interfering with the Earth's climate? One woman says no. My name is Rosalind Peterson and I'm from Mendocino County, California. And my whole life has been involved in some form or another of agriculture crop production from working for the Mendocino County Agricultural Department for five years as an agricultural technologist. Then I worked for the California uh, Department of Agriculture, the state of California, uh, Farm Service Agency, several in the state of California, as well as I am a certified crop loss adjuster for the state of California. I haven't worked in that capacity for many years, but uh, it is one of the reasons that I became interested in a topic called geoengineering. Geoengineering is the large-scale manipulation of the Earth's environment, the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, the Earth itself, in order to supposedly um, change or mask global warming. There are any number of schemes from ocean iron fertilization, which hasn't worked well, all the way to plans for solar radiation management, which means putting particles or chemicals in the atmosphere to reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth. In 2009 and 2010, the UK Parliament and the US House of Representatives Science and Technology Committee met three times uh, in the United States and in England, and the reason that they met was to discuss geoengineering and global geoengineering governance, and also to work together toward finding some rules for geoengineering that would be followed, uh, probably without any public oversight, public consent, or prior, excuse me, prior public notification or any other issues that the public might need to know in order to protect the environment. How long have you been involved in doing research on geoengineering and what, what made you get involved to, to look into the subject? I started realizing that there were atmospheric testing and other things going on in the atmosphere that were going to cause problems for agriculture, crop production, photosynthesis, and some other issues with regard to agriculture. And so in 2002, I started doing research. Geoengineering started to come onto the horizon and be spoken about in uh, the mid-2000s, uh, about 2004, 2005. And then more and more, you'd see more articles. And finally, there were these hearings uh, by the US House of Representatives. And I was concerned that the particles and chemicals uh, sulfur or aluminum oxide that were being proposed by several university professors, a small clique of men who are bound and determined to conduct different kinds of atmospheric geoengineering programs without public consent or oversight or any knowledge ahead of time of these proposals so that people can take action. And these gentlemen started to be proponents of putting particles and chemicals into the atmosphere without consideration of the effects, the negative effects. Well, one of the things about solar radiation management is that when you put, we know that when you put particles and chemicals into the atmosphere, they're going to have effect on ozone. They're going to have an effect on cloud formation. They're going to have an effect on the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth. And when you're talking about curing global warming, supposedly, by reducing the amount of direct sunlight, reaching the Earth, we know that isn't true. The second thing is when you reduce the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth, you're going to lower crop production, 
you're going to have incidences of lack of vitamin D because if direct sunlight doesn't come down to the earth and touch the earth, we won't absorb enough vitamin D through our skin in order to ha lead healthy lives and for our children to lead healthy lives. So we've got the CDC, the University of California, Berkeley. We've got Kaiser Permanente, a large health system agency, all making the statements that we're suffering now from a lack of vitamin D because of increasing cloud cover. And one form of geoengineering is caused by persistent jet contrails. And according to NASA, these contrails turn into man-made clouds. They're composed of jet fuel emissions and water vapor, which is a highly potent greenhouse gas. And the aviation impacts are reducing the amount of direct sunlight through haze and man-made cloud cover. And when you reduce the amount of direct sunlight then and you increase the clouds, you not only change the climate itself, but what you do in this type of geoengineering project is that you reduce the sunlight reaching the Earth, you have lower solar panel power production, you have a lowering of crop production because direct sunlight causes plants to grow healthy and strong due to the photosynthesis process. You begin to also exacerbate global warming in areas like Alaska and the Arctic because, because with clear skies, heat will evaporate away from the Earth. But when you put in man-made cloud cover, according to NASA and Stanford University studies and other research, you are beginning to trap the heat and you make certain areas warmer and so therefore they artificially warm and this impacts our climate and it changes the Earth's atmosphere enough so that we're seeing the direct effect of climate change from already from aviation impacts. In addition to those impacts, we have weather modification programs about 66 of them ongoing in the United States and about 169 ongoing worldwide. These programs change local weather conditions, they change the climate, and they're either ground-based or they use small planes in order to initiate these type of weather modification programs. Private corporations, private individuals, even myself, if I hired a weather modification company, I could enhance the snowfall somewhere, wherever I wanted. Now, California, Texas, Idaho, Colorado, Kansas, New Mexico um, is, getting, is being impacted by weather modification pro uh, programs in the country of Mexico and also from the Texas weather modification programs. A lot of states are involved and they can and one weather modification program can change and be implemented over 186,000 square miles. These are huge in scope and dimension. David Keith and Ken Caldiera, professors uh, from different parts of the country, talk about using sulfur. Well, they took sulfur out of diesel fuel a couple of years ago in California because of asthma and acid rains that impacted our forests. And yet, they turn around and say, well, we could add sulfur to the atmosphere. Well, sulfur is, is, uh, has reproductive toxicity, according to the California EPA. Uh, sulfur is, uh, exacerbates asthma in children, causes acid rains, causes streams and rivers to acidify. And we're talking about putting sulfur into the atmosphere in geoengineering schemes. One is upcoming um, in the next, uh, this year for uh, 2013, I should say. For New Mexico, they want to conduct, uh, David Keith wants to conduct a, a project there, but doesn't want to tell us when for fear that we may object in advance and he might not be able to conduct the experiment. So this is where we have a problem with allowing atmospheric experiments and also understanding that tree decline just isn't a function of one thing, bugs or drought. It's a, it's a function of many things that are going on atmospherically. They don't want the public to um, have any, any invite into the conversation on this. And this is where we need to take action to have an invite into this conversation and to set the rules or to say no before these programs are implemented. 
And when someone tells me that they want to play God with our environment, but they don't want any rules or any restrictions, and they want to do it in secret, then I have growing concerns because I think it's just to, for prestige and to make money. I don't know that necessarily it's going to benefit you and me and um, my grandchildren and other people. Is Rosalind correct? Do geoengineers want the public to be unaware of their climate changing programs? Does geoengineering and weather modification pose a significant risk to the public and environment? And are these programs given full consent from government? While covering the Climate Forward rally in Washington, D.C., I posed that question to Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. With the dangers of climate change, there's been some talks from scientists and even uh, it's been looked at by Congress of ways of, of trying to potentially stop climate change through climate engineering or cloud seeding. Could that be a way that Congress could try to put more funds in research and development to see that as a way to stop climate change? Yeah, the, the, the whole question of geoengineering is, uh, first of all, it's a little bit dangerous. It's not nice to mess with Mother Nature. Remember that old phrase? Um, and the second thing is that geoengineering misses half of the problem. It misses the ocean half of the problem. An enormous amount of the carbon that we emit gets absorbed by the oceans. The oceans just chemically become more acidic as a result. And you can try to offset the temperature effects of our carbon pollution. But if the ocean continues to get acider and acider, it's going to be more and more challenging for our planet and for our species. What about the president? Would his administration endorse a geoengineering program? Various university scientists are are consider considering uh, techniques such as climate engineering, cloud seeding as a way to help prevent extreme weather. Is that something the president may look into with research and development? On the geoengineering side, the climate engineering side, uh, look, it's something that people have been talking about for a while. Uh, this idea that uh, if you can't uh, stop adding to the greenhouse gas layer that traps heat inside, uh, inside the planet or inside the atmosphere, uh, you might uh, take steps to block some of that heat from coming in in the first place. It's an extreme set of measures. Uh, I think some people would like to pretend that that set of options doesn't exist. Others would like to see more activity uh, on it so at least we understand it, uh, both technically but also internationally, so that uh, one country doesn't go ahead and do it by itself. Uh, right now, I think uh, sort of institutions on the periphery of the government are taking the lead on this, the National Academy of Sciences, for example, uh, and others. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect to see a large push from inside this uh, administration. It would raise an enormous amount of controversy. Now that the senator admits Congress has looked into this issue, what about government organizations that deal specifically with weather? While attending a severe weather seminar put together by a Chicago television station, the director of the National Weather Service admits weather modification research has taken place but denies present-day operation. This is a rare opportunity to ask the director of the National Weather Service some questions. Uh, Louis had agreed to come if uh, we allowed uh, some questions. Do you have questions for Louis? And if so, please stand up, and Louis, you can recognize Louis, uh, hand way up in the back. Yes, uh, I had a question. Uh, with the, the high-resolution satellite image you're able to, uh, to look at at the National Weather Service, is there any way you could detect whether a uh, weather modification experiment is taking place or cloud seeding. I know in Kansas and Northern California that takes place and as well as Idaho. Is there any way you can uh, see that in a satellite? And is there a way to communicate that to the public or do meteorologists have a duty to tell the public about weather modification? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not aware of any cloud seeding that was going on for this. I can tell you that, that in... Um, in the 70s, there was a project Storm Fury that uh, people started uh, experimenting with seeding uh, hurricanes way out in the Atlantic. And uh, at that point, there were two things that happened. First of all, they had a small sample size, so they couldn't really determine anything with any kind of statistical significance of whether they were having an impact or not. For those scientists who, so the second thing that happened was for those scientists who claimed they were having an impact, the areas that were subsequently impacted by those storms were ready to sue those scientists. That experiment was ended. Um, so there are, I know this, there's, uh, there's um, 
weather modification that's done under very controlled circumstances, especially out in the west for water resource purposes. Um, in the east, uh, there was some work that was done in Pennsylvania. And again, if people were claiming that they were successfully dri uh, deriving more rainfall out of a system for the western part of the state, the, eastern, the farmers in the eastern part of the state said that was rainfall that would have fallen over us. Yeah. And then they started having that kind of battle within the state, and that ended. So um, it's a very tricky, controversial area, but in real time, we know of no one that was out there doing any kind of seeding. And my question is, uh, I've looked at uh, what they call HAMP, or the Hurricane Modification Program that Homeland Security has talked about. And I, I know uh, there are actually electric companies like the Pacific, PG&E, Pacific Gas, an electric company in Northern California that conducts cloud seeding experiments. As a meteorologist, if you, if you can see that on the radar, is it possible to maybe let the public know, oh, there's cloud seeding here in the area, just well, be cautious? Let's put it this way. Um, cloud seeding now is done more by private sector, and they don't tell you when they're doing it because they consider it proprietary. Okay. So um, we just we do not factor in that type of activity into either our analysis or forecasting. We're just not even made aware of when it's happening. Uh, and it's mostly now uh, focused in the western, uh, western part of the U.S. for water resources. Right, right. But no, it, it doesn't it doesn't play a role in our forecast. Process. And then I, I've looked at what they've called geoengineering or climate engineering, literally uh, modifying the weather to prevent climate change. It, do you do you think that's something that is going to be done on a research basis, or if it's done, I, it, it has to be stringent? I, I, really, I really don't. You know, first of all. Uh, Again, if people are doing that research, I'm, I'm not really aware of it, so I'm not even sure I can answer the question. I know that there are people who continue to talk about, uh, you know, every, they'll propose, you know, like the nuclear, you know, let's, like Tom mentioned, let's, let's set off nuclear explosions and we can destroy a hurricane. Right. Yeah, I've heard they talked about wanting to do, like, you know, volcanic or, eruptions. Or send missiles into tornadoes. Sent tornadoes. And tornadoes. And tornadoes. So what would you like, uh, 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 an exploding tornado? Uh, <laughs> it's going to just make things worse. So right, we don't right. really, we don't really, it's, it's, it's not an update. Yeah. yeah, the modifications, I think, are more... Uh, you know, uh, and this is not my center of expertise, but long-term modifications of environments by planting trees and changing slow modification of ecosystems in a in a responsible manner sometimes uh, may over time or not help or, don't, offset, or don't cut down the forest and south down. Right. they take in carbon dioxide and and stuff. but you're talking about vast energy scales so to make significant impacts yeah. on them right. uh, like cuz cuz i know they do they there is conducted cloud seeding experiments yeah. taking place is it? Do you think that's more private corporations that are doing it for research purposes? I think cloud seeding. Is. I'm not. I'm not that familiar, but I don't know of any government programs dealing in that. Okay. It's pretty much uh, that was like Project Serum Fleury like way back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, there's nothing like that. That's for sure. <laughs> is the director of the National Weather Service oblivious to the current day weather modification programs taking place? Or is he covering up a program that the public should not know about? In the end, I've come to find out that several forms of modification are taking place. From the genetic modification of our food supply, to the engineering of Earth's climate, both presented as solutions to fight climate change. Both may lead us into a situation we can't come back from. Both could lead us into a genetically modified society.
Isn't that, yeah, isn't that amazing?